नमो तस्से भगवतो अरहतो सम्मासंबुद्धस्य नमो तस्से भगवतो अरहतो सम्मासंबुद्धस्य नमो तस्से भगवतो अरहतो सम्मासंबुद्धस्य कतंच भिक्वे भिक्खु वेदना सुवेदना नुपस्सी इद भिक्वे भिक्खु सुकं वेदनं वेदियमानो सुकं वेदनं वेद्यामीति पजानाति दुखं वेदनं वेदियमानो दुखं वेदनं वेद्यामीति पजानाति अदुखम सुखं वेदनं वेदियमानो अदुखम सुखं वेदनं वेद्यामीति पजानाति Sāmi saṅvā dukkhaṁ vedanaṁ vedyamāno Sāmi saṅ dukkhaṁ vedanaṁ vedyāmīti pajānāti Nirāmi saṅvā dukkhaṁ vedanaṁ vedyamāno Nirāmi saṅvā sukhaṁ vedanaṁ vedyāmīti pajānāti Sāmi saṅvā dukkhaṁ vedanaṁ vedyamāno Sāmi saṅvā dukkhaṁ vedanaṁ वेदयामीति पजानाति निरामि संवा दुखं वेदनं वेदयमानो निरामि संग दुखं वेदनं वेदयामीति पजानाति सामि संवा अदुखं मसुखं वेदनं वेदयमानो सामि संवा अदुखं मसुखं वेदनं वेदयामीति पजानाति निरामि संवा अदुखम सुखं वेदनं वेदियमानो निरामि संवा अदुखम सुखं वेदनं वेद्यामीति पजानाति इति अज्ञतं वा वेदनासु वेदनानु पश्चि विहरति भयधावा वेदनासु वेदनानु पश्चि विहरति अज्ञत भाई धावा वेदना सुवेदना नुपस्सी विहरति सामुदय धम्मा नुपस्सी वा वेदना सुविहरति वायदम्मा नुपस्सी वा वेदना सुविहरति सामुदय वायदम्मा नुपस्सी वा वेदना सुविहरति अति वेदना तिवा साति पाचु पाठी था होति याव देवन्यान मत्थाय पतिस्थति मत्थाय अनिस्तितो च विहरति न च किंचिलो के उपादियति इवंच को भिक्वे भिक्कु वेदना सुवेदना नुपसी विहरति ये दिवोतीस इस लॉन्ग पाली रिसाइटेशन indicates the second lobe, the second part of the Satipattana Sutta. Satipattana Sutta itself is being translated as four foundations of mindfulness. The first foundation is seeing the body as the body. Seeing body as the body. And the second one is feeling the feelings just as feelings. So this consists the second part. So for the early part of the contemplation of the body as body consists about eight talks, more than eight hours. So today I thought of touching the second one, the second law in this particular sutta, that is the feelings. The difference is the contemplation upon the body as body is in the meditation jargon we call contemplation on the materiality, the body. And when it shifts into the feelings, now we are slowly stepping into the mental part, the immaterial part of the life. One entity, one being, means the both, the mentality and materiality, the corporeality and the mentality. Out of these two, 
it's a very important thing that one must start with the gross part or tangible part, the concrete part of the being, of the entity, that is the materiality. Then it is easy for the beginner, because the material part, you can see, you can measure, you can weigh it. So therefore, at least you can see the shape of it. Just like take a snapshot. You can see the different shapes in the different colors. And way further when you observe, you can see each and every aspect of the life has different balance. So once you see in the shape of any phenomena, and then continuity of the observation means the very manner how the phenomena takes place according to the time dimension or chronological order. So therefore, the early two aspects of seeing the shape as well as the observing the manner is just physics. It is no more religious. It is, if you are looking, you will see. If you are not looking, you won't. So when you are asked to see the in breath and out breath. One may see the in breath is as closing the door and the out breath is as opening the door. Or otherwise you may see in breath is swinging the uh, swing forward and the out breath is like coming back backward. So like as many many shapes you can attribute. But when you are continue to see, you may see the swing is slowly, slowly, slowly calming down, and the movements and the oscillation is reducing, or so it is increasing. That are the, these are the uh, things we call as the manner. And once these two, the shape which is leading to the manner, and the still if you are incessant manner going to observe the same phenomena you will see this manner is ever changing. That is why in the breathing we say at the beginning, Sato Vasasati, Sato Pasasati, you just be mindfulness, be, be mindful in on, in, breath and on, out breath. It's so simple, you are in breath versus out breath. But when you are furthering, keep on continuing, you can see the in breath is in the, in the cessation manner. At the beginning you see the long in breath and slowly it becomes shorter. And the out breath also at the beginning it becomes longer and slowly it becomes shorter. This is one way of observation. And once these two continue to see, you may see the beginning versus the middle up to the end of the very in breath. So there you can see, uh, when you are about to see the beginning, the middle and the end, enormous amount of information, enormous amount of observations happen. So more you closer become, more you immediate become, rather you will lose the shapes and the manner, and you just see there are some characteristics, some uh, intrinsic nature that it is ever changing moment to moment and when yielding into the out breath and it is also from the beginning to the end so much of changes still you are in materiality of course this is the one of the best way of observing without disturbance of thoughts or any sound disturbance or any pains, if you are going to see, you will see that slowly, 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 in breath and out breath, you feel the whole process so much so that you won't feel the difference between the in breath and out breath. It will be like a continuous flow, like a cycle. When you are come up to that level, if you are not really instructed 
And if you are not very diligent and you have no quick wit, you will worry thinking that I can't see the breath or my mindfulness is disturbed or my concentration is uh, hesitated, gone, destroyed. So therefore you will get discouraged. But if you can clearly explain that to the teacher or an experienced yogi, he will say, nothing to worry, this is the way it happens. At the beginning, shapes are quite contradictory. This forward movement of the swing and the backward movement of the swing, like it is black and white different. When you come to the manners, still you can feel the difference. But when you are proceeding further, losing the shapes and the manner, you will just feel the natural characteristics. You may see just stiffness, just movements, just hot heat, the cold, the touching sensation, the tinkling sensation, binami, many, many things. And that is the point where you may fail to see the difference between the in-breath and out-breath. But still, if you are sharp enough, you may see and you, are, you can observe the mindfulness is intact, undisturbed. And the concentration also undipped, undisturbed, even though the yogi cannot feel the difference between the in-breath and out-breath. So you are supposed to continue further. So much it can be complete concentration meditation. Still you are observing the, the strike element, the air draft, the air column. But proceeding further, when you are uh, just narrowing the different distance between the observing mind and the observed uh, object, so the, your mind can get absorbed or that anapana meditation or mindfulness of in breath and out breath can give, you, give rise to first jhana, second jhana, third jhana and fourth jhana like absorption also. So therefore the first part where the materiality, the corporeality is being talked about can lead either to concentration or to uh, inside meditation. When the inside happens, right from the beginning you will feel the sensations, the stiffness, tension, movements and all the kind of things. So therefore inside yogi, more and more you be close to the object, more and more the my steadfastness of the mindfulness, so you can see the most vivid and very uh, fast changing movements in the object. So when these things happen, definitely you can't see the difference between the in-breath and out-breath. When that is happening, if you are careful and if you are really following the um, instructions, you can find, even though there is no difference between the in and out breathing, still the meditation is there, still you can continue. So you have to have your self-confidence. When you go further and further, instead of the materialistic part of the phenomena, you are bound to end up with just feelings. You just feel incoming breath, you may feel the coolness, the heat, the rubbing sensation, and the expansion, contractions, tinglings, benumbing, all the kind of feelings. So, at the beginning you start with corporeality or the materiality, and now the material aspect of earth element, the water element, the heat element, the fire element and the air element, you can experience through feelings. When the feelings happen, there's a multifaceted kind of cross-section you can see in the beginning or middle or at the end of inbreath, beginning, the middle and end of the outbreak. So when it happens, the kaya anupasana contemplation on the body as body, slowly, slowly yielding into the Vedana Anupasana, the experience of feeling or contemplation upon feeling as feelings takes place. So this is one of the, uh, the critical point or kind of a 
for the important change well, the beginner mostly get confused so therefore they are if your mindfulness is steadfast and the concentration is intact uh, you are better off otherwise uh, you will be quite get confused be will dead the answer the way out it way out for that kind of thing is from right from the beginning up to this point if your mindfulness is undisturbed definitely you can face the situation more boldly with confidence and this is the basic pre- preliminaries we are the gross materiality is slowly slowly yielding into or give size to the mentality when this is happening the 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 sutta itself the discourse itself is asking yogi asking the meditator to be aware of the feelings and that is what it is so you must you must when you are feeling when feeling is <coughs> they are you whether it is a comfortable feeling or pleasurable or unpleasurable or it is neutral whatever it happens you must be ready and prepared to not the feelings as feelings sometimes you may not feel so much of details of the inbred and outbred but generally you feel happy because for the moment there are no body pains the continuity of mindfulness is there therefore general happiness or pleasure also can come or otherwise due to the clear observation of the details of the in breath and out breath also can give the pleasurable feeling when play, when feeling a pleasure he, he must know i feel a pleasurable sensation so this won't make much of a, an electric effect you know that you are feeling pleasure you know feeling pleasure that indicates do not react on the pleasure and that same statement goes when you plea when you when feeling an unpleasant feeling you must know or the yogi he knows that i am experiencing an unpleasant feeling so this is the most uh, important thing not the pleasurable thing the unpleasurable the unpleasure the, un- the, the lack of pleasure or the difficulty of pain also have two origins one thing is when you are losing the difference between the inbred and outbred and in experience yogi self and pleasure they feel disheartened they feel something wrong they are also uh, the pain can arise physical or mental sometimes if this kind of uh, disheartening happens the simple body pains also can arise because by that time 10 20 minutes pass so they are for bodily pains also can so therefore the inexperienced yogi have two three traps on the way if it is good still it is also a trap where you feel pleasure when the pleasure arises you feel like a pleasurable feeling and that also can be a trap and when it is a unpleasure or pain you may feel painful and there also you can react so the main instruction is to not to not to react but see pain pressure as pressure and the pain as the pain whatever may be the instruction how ever it is clear habitually we are bound to react upon this pressure and the pain so therefore this is a kind of an acid test before furthering into the mentality you are at the threshold level at the gate of the house or at the door you are being tested 
given the pleasurable feeling, given the painful feeling, how do you, how you are going to react? If as far as you are reacting, you are sitting will not last for more than half an hour. Before that you will get up and go. Because the change over from the material to the mentality is still not being well taken. It's not handled well. So therefore that you have to listen it, you have to discuss it, and you have to expect when the continuity of the mindfulness on in breath and breathing uh, in breath and out breath happens, as the time passes the either bodily pain or disheartening due to the um, unsuccessful effort of mindfulness, the pain can come. Whether it is pleasure or pain, both are called feelings. So, if you are not mindful on any meditative object, still you are feeling the pleasure and pain, but it is not being a case for you, so you do not feel that kind of changes as far as you are in the day-to-day -day activity. But whenever you give the attention to the primary object or object of meditation, so a few minutes time the, play, the pain become either pleasure or pain the feelings become prominent and pain gives rise to the pleasure, pleasure gives rise to the pain and it is like a, a kind of a torturing so therefore those who are impatient find it's a hurdle very difficult to jump over very difficult to penetrate so therefore you must have certain amount of patience and the tolerance just to not to give up just at the face of pleasurable or painful feeling instead you have to endure it to see the middle of it when the pleasure comes you must know now the pleasure has arisen, arisen due to the successful of the meditation or due to the uh, appearance of the natural characteristic of the in-breath and out-breath. So, not to get, not to lose the mindfulness on the meditation so that you have to be aware, now I am in the pleasure. That means non-reaction. That means the silence observation. Same thing to the pain also. So, when the middle of the feelings are being tackled, slowly, slowly your confidence as well as your the stamina in the meditation is being challenged and be slowly, slowly reinforced, slowly, slowly galvanized. So that is how just at the face of the pleasure or pain, you are not going to decide something, not going to react, instead try to take it. The pleasure as the pleasure and the pain as the pain. This is called contemplation on the feelings as feelings, not as enemies or not as friends, just feelings. So when these two are being mastered, there is an immediate benefit for the yogi. That is to say, if I am to cite another example or um, quotation, when you are breathing in breath, and you can feel from the beginning, middle, to the middle, to the end. And before going to feel the outbreath, there is a gap between. What is the feeling in the gap? You feel it is unperceivable. The mind is in a black box. It can't feel it. And it immediately waiting for the outbreath to happen, and there you may be efficient, to catch it and perceive it, and when it is starting and passing through the middle and to the end, again there is a gap before the outbreath. Exactly like when the pain arisen, and if you can observe through the middle, when it ceases, before a, another feeling comes, pressure or pain, there is a gap. Sometimes that gap is very long. But you are not experiencing it. You don't feel anything there. And again, when the 
another feeling comes, pressure or pain, again it will be a case and you will be observing the beginning, the middle and the end. So more and more you try to see the irrespective of the pain and pleasure, each and every feeling, you may find as a huge space between two feelings. As if you are looking at the sky in the night, and if you see stars, after a long time you may see between stars a huge space, deep space, but looking at the sky you are not aiming at the space, usually you see the positive signs, the stars, the light. But if you observe long time, you may see most of the time what you see is just the space, just the darkness. And you don't have any value for that because you are always aimed at the positive things, the light. Exactly like through the materiality, when you are going to the mentality, if you are not rushing, if you are not quickly reacting, if you are patient enough to see the beginning, the middle and the end of the pleasure, beginning, the middle and the end of the pain, you may find in between there is a huge gap. And that is called Adukkama Sukha Vedana, not pain, not pleasure. A neutral kind of a feeling and the commentary itself is accepting it is just like the darkness, our eyes can't see, our consciousness can't touch it, but well, it is so subtle. So that is how pain, we, normally we feel pain gives rise to the pleasure and pleasure gives rise to pain and therefore a kind of a continuity regarding the feeling. But most of the time you may find there are a huge gap. There are gap between two feelings. So this is a very deep, very subtle observation and it is not much difficult to experience. Regarding this, there is one clue, you can take it from the Chulavedala Sutta, where the Upasaka Visaka is questioning the, the nun, Namadina, he is asking, what is the pain and pleasure in the pleasurable feeling? So it appears like an absurd question. What is the pain and pleasure in the pleasurable feeling? The Dhammadina very appropriately answers, the beginning of the pleasurable feeling is a pleasure, the disappearance of the pleasurable feeling is a pain. So it is very nice as well as a practical, pragmatic answer. Then again the Upasakas Visaka is asking, what is the pain and pleasure of the painful feeling? Then she says, rising of the pain is a painful, but the disappearance of the pain is pleasurable. But if you are not meditating, if you are not listening to this kind of thing, you can't see the pain in the pleasure and the pleasure in the pain. But if you rationalize it and if you are going to use your <coughs> information knowledge, that is true, theoretically true. But we are impatient to see it. Whenever the pleasurable feeling arises, then you feel pleasure. You are happy. But when it is going, you are fading off, you feel this heart. Three months we have a very pleasurable meditation. Now tomorrow it is going to cease our oh, pleasure. Finished. Then pain. So much the pleasure, that much the pain. So what is the use of this pleasure? It is going to give a big hiatus and then going to give a big ebb of pain. So ultimately positive negative sum up zero. Nothing left. And once that pain gone, if one is very mindful and be an inside yogi and go through this pain and see at the beginning pain is a pain and when it is disappearing it is a pleasure, it is also possible. For that you must enter encounter pain. So therefore pain is a very good test 
a very good assistant for someone to test his or her the tolerance, the endurance, the stamina. More than that, this is kind of explainable physics. It is positive and negative uh, rational knowledge. But the most important and invitive question is, what is the pain and pleasure of the indifferent feeling? Then the Dhammadina, the nun, sees an Aran says, if you are aware of the indifference feeling, it is a pleasure. If you do not know the indifference feeling, it is a pain. It's a loss. So throughout our life, we may pass without feeling the indifference feeling. Then whole life is in pain. It's a disappointment. The day you come to understand the indifference feeling and as it is very subtle and only possible for human beings and only possible for those who inside meditators and the day you come to know you will be feeling, feel so much happy because it is just under the nose. Only the thing is the correct perspective. In Sapman is guiding, not directly to the indifference feeling, he may guide you to see the in breath and out breath. And at the beginning, in breath and out breath also very difficult to feel. But when you have continued to see in breath and out breath, you may just see the difference between in breath and out breath. And then, that is still material sphere, and then when it's changing to the feelings, the pleasure, the pain, you have been asked to see the beginning, the middle and the end of the pain. The beginning, the middle and the end of the pressure. Ah, then only you will be aware, you will be facing the indifference. But usually no one finds, no one can find any positive constructive path of observing or experiencing the indifference. But being aware of the indifference is a kind of a pleasure immaterial. The pain and pleasure has a reason, materialistic or immaterialistic may be, but the indifference pain is basically immaterial. So that is the point, that is the place your mind is mostly is, that you do not know. So that's how nicely the Buddha is bringing you back to the mentality that is to say, most of the time you are in the indifference, but you do not know. So therefore, you always see pleasure at the cost of pain. And whenever the pain happens, you are reacting and you are trying to wipe it off and as an enemy. And whenever the pleasure comes, you will be very happy and you will think that you are lucky and you will think you are wise and you will think you have the ability, all the kind of the positive statements. But you do not know most of the time you are in indifference and that is mostly covered with ignorance. So whenever the ignorance removed or whenever you be aware into the indifference is the pleasure. It is something like being aware to your dream. Being aware or awakening to the sleep. It appears like quite irrational, it appears like impossible. But if you are really following the instruction and follow the material first kind of contemplation, if we need it, the materiality gives rise to the mentality, and there are also peaks of pleasure and pain who play a big game at the beginning. But if you are endured to go further towards the tail end, you may see pain and pleasure both gives rise to this mostly common, the indifference. When you go to the beach, usually you look at the, the thin layer of water at the beach and it's like waves. You can count the waves. One wave goes and then another comes, that breaks and again goes, so you can count. And when you go a little deep, you can see wave after wave comes, no breaking and no going back. And you go further little, it is just a glare. 
when the hot sun, you can just see the glare. You can't see wave by wave. It's a mix, it's a mix of, of wave. But if you are lucky enough, look further at the horizon, no waves. Not a single wave. It is dead. It's a dead cross line. So as exactly the same, when the meditation is very thin, it is immature, when it is not seasoned, you can see big ups and downs. You can see waves, sometimes tsunamis. And even without that, waves are there. But if you are a little deeper, go further, the difference between one wave to the other disappears. You may see all the time water is in a shake. And if there are no waves, sometimes freezes. So when you go further and further, when the meditation becomes deeper and deeper, you will get lost in the indifference. So that is why the Buddha says, before you go to that kind of deep experience, you must be responsible morally to have your morality established. Otherwise you will get quite a frightening experience or you may say you are so alienated. You feel like cornered. You feel like outcasted. And you feel like lost. Simply you may complain that I am I have lost my mindfulness. I have lost my concentration. I don't know where I am. I have no feeling on the time. I have no feeling on the space, so it appears like the kite gone beyond the thread. So it has been broken off. Like. And this is not kind of a breaking off. That is the that is how the gross thing with the continuous observation yielding to the subtler and subtler. So when the feelings are coming, the presentation comes at the beginning the pleasure and then the pain at last the indifference, no pain, no pleasure kind. And then, these all three put into two cages, one kind of set, that means one kind of pleasure, pain, and the uh, indifference belongs to the household life. Another set, that means the pain, the pleasure, pain, and the indifference to the renunciated life. So then the feelings become six folds. At the beginning, pain, pleasure and indifference. Now when you cut into the household pleasure, pain and the indifference, versus the renunciated, nisarana sita. First one is called geha sita. Nisarana sita means renunciated people also have pain, pleasure and the indifference. And then Buddha says, to uh, remind for the sake of the book knowledge, the pay, pleasure itself can have through the ear, through the eye, sorry, through the eye, through the ear, through the nose, through the tongue, through the body and through the mind base. So like that, the pain also have six folds and indifference also have six folds in the household sensuous life. And when you come to the uh, Renunciation. Also, the six folds from the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and the mind, pleasure, pain and the indifference. So you can see how much multivarious and multifaceted the feelings are. But basically start from the pain and pleasure. So whole the trip or whole discipline or dispensation here they are in the Maha uh, Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta, Buddha is explaining how this household pleasure, pain and the individual can lead to the, the complete emancipation. So he says, in the you know, geometrical kind of equations, you must be skillful to replace the household kind of pleasure from the renunciated kind of pleasure. So, for in my language, I would say 
the sensuous kind of pleasure or materialistic kind of pleasure must be replaced from immaterial kind of pleasure. So in the text it says, household kind of pleasure being replaced by the renunciated kind of pleasure. Gyasita somanasaya, Gyasita somanasaya, Nisar Nisar somanasaya, Nisaya, Gyasita Nisar somanasaya, Pajata. So you have, you, in the day to day life, you often ask the question, how the meditation could be incorporated into the day to day life? Because 24 hours, no one can, no one have bonus. 24 is fixed. So therefore, there is not the time given for meditation by birth. Our 24 time hours of time is filled with some time work of 25 hours. So much of the pleasure, and so much of the pressure. So under this pressure, often the household kind of pleasure also incorporated, but. Very rarely you have chances to feel this immaterial kind of pleasure. For that, first and foremost, you must close your eyes. You must go to the solitude place. You must not entertain the smell. You must not entertain talking or tasting. You must not entertain other bodily activities and you must not entertain the rational thinking. And then only immaterial kind of pressure comes only for the concentration meditators and the uh, inside meditators. Even then, it takes long time for you to get some kind of a pleasure in meditation. So therefore, at the beginning, the introduction, it is very difficult someone to get convinced, get verified about the renunciated kind of pleasure or immaterial kind of pleasure. So therefore you must have enormous amount of faith, enormous amount of energy to pass this barrier. Then only you can see 23 hours of day-to-day -day activities can be replaced or can be rectified through one hour of sitting meditation, a successful session. So that is the point where you may see, due to your responsibilities and the, all the bondages, you have to work. Otherwise no one to win your bread. So when you are doing, at least if you are going to give half an hour to one hour, one day you can see all the accumulation of pressure, you can sometimes brush it off and wipe it off by sitting meditation whenever you feel the immaterial kind of pressure. So they are the wise people, those who are planning for the betterment of their life, always planning to maximize this kind of a immaterial pressure coming through the relaxation in the eye, relaxation in the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind. For that only you have to implant or replace that with the meditative object. When you are successful, mindfully and concentrate on the object of meditation, then that kind of pleasure comes. So you have to replace the household kind of pleasure from the renunciated kind of pleasure. That is the advice of the Buddha. And as far as the dukkha or the pain is concerned, you have to know, you must understand when you are associating the temples and associating the meditating people, you will know there is a kind of a suffering or pain in the household life. Whenever your relatives or yourself hurt or stuck by disease or something like that, you are being hurt. And your properties and your loved one being, uh, being <coughs> disturbed or destroyed, then again the pain. So you feel no way out. That is why you always seek for pleasure. But that pleasure also not permanent. But instead, when you are associating this kind of places, you may see the renunciated people have a separate kind of life, no burden with their family affairs, no burden with their earnings in the life, but even then they also have a kind of pain. Household pain, you have no question. But what is the pain of the yogi, what is the pain of the monk, 
the Buddha says, they are so desperate, they have not become a sotapanna yet. Therefore, they are very desperate. They say, my meditation is not successful. So they are disheartened. That disheartened, that pain is called renunciated kind of pain. Buddha says that pain is better than the household kind of pain. I don't know whether you will be agreed or not. Both appear to be pain, but this pain is better. But it's a hard thing. But when you come to a retreat, of course, temporarily you are, you are forgetting about, as much as possible, that kind of burden of the children and all the responsibilities and the earnings and everything. But even then, not all the time you are going back with pleasure. Sometimes you are desperate. Your last retreat was good, but this is bad. Your last sitting was good, this is bad. Right? That is also associated with pain. But that pain is appreciated. That is also coming out of the kind of a desire. But that desire is not on the material kind of thing. It is on the <coughs> immaterial. There is also pain. So household pain must be replaced by the redundant kind of pain. And then the indifference. In the household also, you have most of the time when you are in sleep or when you are not feeling peak pain or pleasure, you are most of the time in the <coughs> indifference, but you are ignorant. And when you come to the meditation also, you find sometimes when meditation is going on, object completely disappear. Your mindfulness and the concentration is there, but nothing to feel. Most of the time it is that you are posing questions to the teacher, then what to do? So there are your chances are more to be aware of this kind of indifference. So Buddha says that the unknown or the indifference which is associated with in the ignorant should be replaced by this indifference where you can be aware of it. You can systematically go into that. So that is better. So ultimately if these three equations are well studied, you will end up with only the renunciated kind of pressure, renunciated kind of pain, renunciated kind of indifference. And they are, the Buddha says, replace the indifferent kind of pain by the indifferent kind of pleasure. This is the point I wanted a little enlarge or to deal. How to replace the renunciated kind of pain by renunciated kind of pleasure? For example, you go for meditation on or mindfulness on in breath and out breath. And you, while meditating, sometimes you deal with the obvious, conspicuous object in breath and out breath, or rising and falling, or walking left and right. But later, sometimes you find it is leaving nowhere, or leaving to bewilderment, and the pain comes. What is happening, no, no one knows. Instead of observing the materiality of in-breath and out-breath, mind has no any discipline, completely scattered and ending up with the disappointment, ending up with disheartening. So then you don't know what to do. But they are your disheartening or disappointment is a mental aspect if you are aware of it, if you are mindful on this disappointment and the disheartening, is the prime source of the pleasure. That is very difficult for someone to believe unless otherwise he experience it. Because whatever the, the gradient, whatever the degree of disheartening, your ability to understand that I am in the disheartened is never be forsaken. So therefore, whatever the disheartening, whatever the um, disappointment, whatever the pain appears, you can be aware that I am in a pain because your objective has not been fulfilled. So that very understanding is a 
with the second grade of or higher advanced level of mindfulness on feeling. Then immediately, by knowing that I am in a disheartened, and, and by knowing that you are mindful on the disheartening, gives rise to kind, kind of a contentment and the pleasure. So that is the way the Buddha is asking, replace the renunciated kind of pain by renunciated kind of pleasure. But it is not a task of the foolish people, not of the, the stupid people. You have to be very sharp that your object of meditation is no more. Mind is completely disheartened and it is disappointed. But you can be aware of that disappointment, that dishearten. That is the way the mindfulness is going to in the double fold manner. That is the way you can go through the dishearten, the disappointment, the pain from the beginning, the middle and the end. And that is the point where Dhammadina, the Arahant, explaining the appearance of the disheartening is pain, yes. That if you are patient enough to see the end part, the disappearance part of the disheartened, disheartened or pain is a pleasure. So if you are impatient, of course you may pay everything, but there is no one to get the results because you are impatient and you have to get up and go. So if you are patient enough to see, all the disappointments are yielding to a pleasure if you are continue to observe. Or in the sense you can see, <coughs> all the dark clouds have a civil light. But if you are looking only the dark side and you are not efficient to see the silver line, that definitely unlucky. To see the silver line, you have to see the totality. That is what the meaning of observing the pain or contemplating the pain, uh, or sorry, of contemplating the feeling as feeling. Don't try to rush towards the painful thing to wipe it off. If it is so, what you are wiping it Vibing of is the pleasure. If you are patient, you will be end up with pleasure. So therefore, all the painful feeling can be recycled. Once you recycle, it is yielding to the pain, so pressure. So it is a kind of a thing you have to realize. If you are kind of thing, you have to verify. But the Buddha is giving in the simple language, replace the renunciated kind of feeling, sorry, relaxation kind of pain by the pressure. But the mechanism behind is, you have to, the solution behind is, you have to take it from the Chulavetala Sutta, where the Dhammadina is, Arahan Dhammadina is, explaining the Visaka Upasaka, the beginning of the pain is pain, the disappearance of the pain is pressure. So therefore, in singular, we call Pamini Duk Paniradai. If you are going to fight with the pain, definitely end up with the sour taste. But if you are trying to wait it, you are trying to endure it, try to be with it, ultimately you can see the pressure. So this is how in the yogis, those experienced yogis, do not really give up whenever this pain arises. They say, that is my teaching in the Burma, he says, when the pain appears in the inside meditation, it's a good omen. That means your meditation is in the real progress if you are to endure it. But if you are going to give up it, uh, then it is unlucky. So that is how the <coughs> the renunciated kind of Pleasure, pain can be replaced by the renunciated kind of pain, uh, sorry, pleasure. And when it is happening, that pleasure that you have earned through your very mindfulness also disappearing. So therefore you must not get attracted by your skillfulness, by your the smartness. Then you must understand this is just enough to compensate the pain, but the pleasure itself is not substantial. It's also changing. But instead of the pleasure, the indifference is more consistent. 
it is more intrinsic, it is more natural than the vibrations of pain and pleasure. So most mature people, those who have real understanding about this, this sansaric game, will compromise not to go for the pressure, but to accept the indifference. So that is why the Buddha's words, it says, replace the renunciated kind of pleasure by the renunciated kind of indifference. So then even the pain comes or pleasure comes, you just see them as from the beginning, the middle and the end, that's all. And then you are going, you will be not shaken, you will not taken for a ride, but ultimately you will calm down and come to the indifference kind of thing. So when the individual comes, just like a turtle taking the, all the limbs into the shell, you are, you are hearing the sounds, but still you are not carried away. You know, I must try to be with the mindfulness on breathing, where early breathing was taking place. You just be there, but the touching point also not there. In and out also not there, but you just keep the mind there. And the pain also comes, but you are unshaken. And the thoughts also coming. But you can see, still you can save and continue with the mindfulness. Likewise, the totality of the experience comes, but you are not going to sort them out. You are just trying to be with the primary object, then the indifference kind of, uh, the renunciated kind of indifference, and there you feel like you are walking in the heavy rain with the full Macintosh and you are not get wet. So you can not like in the day, not like in the dry day, you have to slow a little, but you are, you can go through the rain. Like that you are mindfulness and the concentration give us such a shelter, such kind of a protection, you are running a risk or you become a risk lover. You will invite the pain, you will invite the sounds, you will invite the thoughts, whatever it comes, you know how to save your primary object. So that is how the yogi becomes slowly, slowly trained to the indifference. And that indifference also, two kinds. One thing is nanatta sita ekagata, nanatta sita upekha and ekakka sita upekha is a very subtle point. But for the sake of theory, what I have to say is, the early part, early part of this indifference is still compared with the disturbances. So you see, it is an alternative to the disturbance. But when it becomes seasoned, when it becomes uh, experienced, when it becomes familiar, you are not going to do, you are going to reel to the pit of it, going to the middle of it. And that is the point, the concentration meditation give rise to the vipassana deep uh, experience of the indifference that the human mind can't think about. As far as there is a being, myself or self-identity or ego, you can't feel it. So it is happening in a sequential manner. So this is the one you feel or you find unexplainable. You can't find a shape there, you can't find a manner, you can't feel anything, but you know you are not dead. You know you are not sleepy. You know you are not fainted. But there is a deep, deep inside the tunnel. This needs so much of brevity. If you have any kind of a shaky or uh, uncertainty, uh, doubts about your morality, so your progress will be very slow. So therefore at that level, the explanation is very hard for teacher to understand what the yogi is telling, but the yogi and the teacher has to go back to the zero and see the track. If the track is clear, is guessing, yeah, this is the place he is, and ask them to be reinforced with their morality, be brave, continue. Let the mind to be seasoned with this one. And that is the point. You are challenging your very self. You find you can go through all the kind of pain, pleasure, happiness, gain, 
lost and all the kind of thing, but the inner continuity of the stream of consciousness is unshaken. So all the losses and the gains in your relatives, I said that the, the property can't touch this thing, can't touch this stream of consciousness. But you do not know this. So therefore even in the deathbed, when it is coming to just, just mere thread, you will not be shaken. You know all the other parts are additional. All the other parts are the removable parts. All the other parts are detachable parts. That is the suffering. That very pit is do not understand the good and bad. That do not understand correct and wrong. That does not understand the pain and pleasure. That do not understand the suffering. But we are very uh, frightened to recognize ourselves with that stream of consciousness. Instead, we are very happy to see pictures and to get our recognition. And to hear sounds and to get our recognition. And to smell and to taste and the other comforts and the, our familiar pet thoughts. And you do not know these are acquired things. They are highly polluted with the perceptions, highly polluted with the mental proliferation. But most of your decisions and most of our future planning based upon these volatile things, detachable things. As far as it is based upon this detachable part, you can understand what will happen the end result of that kind of decision. Unless otherwise you train to come back to this indifference, sometimes smeared with the six senses, sometimes not smeared, then you will understand what is the real nature or simply who am I. And that is at that point, here now I am is much, much one-pointed. Really also you have kind of, uh, here I am now, when you are just sitting and observing the sitting posture, there is a kind of a gross mindfulness in where I am, or here I am, who am I? But when you are replacing the all the feelings of the household life by the renunciated life, and the renunciated pain also with the renunciated pressure, the pressure also replaced by the renunciated kind of indifference, and the renunciated kind of indifference also replaced by the pit going back middle, there is no being. It's the Dhammata. If the universal law is working, you are just mere observer. You have to be so detached, otherwise you can't go up to that level. And you will understand this very thing is the only suitable thing if you are to say, this is I am, but this is, you won't say, this is, that is I am. And that is also momentary. As far as you are in this momentariness, you are not going to recognize this as myself, and it is mere dhammata. It is happening according to universal law, and you are just observing. That is what called insight. As far as you are losing that, you are outside. You are in the sight scene. You are in, taken for a ride. So never end it. The day you understand and come back to the insight, one day through the feelings you can come up to that level for a split second. Or the potential can be recognized. That does not indicate you are fully enlightened or you are fully irreversibly there. Just to see the potential. And unlucky enough, you will find it is uncommunicable. Very difficult to talk because all our grammar, all our communications, all our symbols are based upon feelings. That is why the whole Hindu tradition is called Veda, based upon the feelings. When the feelings are gone or feelings are neutralized, you can't communicate. And that is the biggest Veda. That is the biggest knowledge, and that is biggest wisdom too. So therefore, pay some, there are meditation methods completely based upon feelings. True, that you can do, but wise advice is, first go to the materiality, and through the materiality, make your body, make your breathing, make your meditative mind be subtle. 
when it becomes subtle, sometimes through meditators' involvement or automatically it changes into the mentality. Mentality starts with feelings. And these feelings have so much of layers, one replaced by the other, one replaced by the other. The basic principle is given, idang nisaya, idang pajata. Replace this due to this, or replace gross due to the subtlety. So when it is happening, each and every moment you become mindful, slowly, slowly you are going from gross to the subtle. Therefore, the rule of thumb in the Vipassana says, start where the prominent things are. Do not try to subtle it at the beginning. Once you are discriminated, you understand the gross thing, this very understanding giving you a chance to replace that very gross thing by somewhat subtle thing. And then you dwell upon that. And when you become familiar with this somewhat subtle thing, you may get opportunity to still subtle about the thing. Then you have to replace the subtle thing from the subtlest. Like you are going climbing on a ladder, more and more steps in the upper you hold, more and more you lose, then more and more you touch the upper layer by the hand, more and more your lower layers will be let go through the legs. More and more you touch in up there, you are going little and little by little up. Any time you feel uncomfortable, stop it. Come back. Next day also you are going. When you are going more and more, you will be more familiar in the early parts of the meditation, ABC. Therefore, the insight yogi must be always entertain the beginner's mind. Because you know from the beginning, from the zero, how to develop into such a very complicated and very subtle and leading to the nothingness kind of experience. So therefore, whenever you go to the very subtle level, how much you have compassionate to say your loved one, you can pass the experience. You can only say others, this is the method. You have to try yourself. Then only they can go up to there. So therefore, you have to understand it when you come to the deep Dhamma, it's a personal affair. It's a simply the affair in the present moment. And the simply the affair in, the, in this place. Here, now, I. So whether it is explained through the materiality or whether it is explained through the feeling, basic rules are there. Start with the rough, gross thing and leave uh, lead to the subtlety and life and slowly slowly when it's going the most subtle forms of the uh, feeling so he can feel all the gamut of all the uh, qualities of feelings that one can experience iti tangwa vedana asu vedana pasti all the things you have to experience if you are going to cut off something and going to specialize other, so much so your understanding is crippled. So much so your understanding is paralyzed. So you have to see all the Vedana is the messenger. You have to understand. And it is Bhaiddhava Vedana, so Vedana no Pasivi He can understand the next person to you may not be a Buddhist, may not be a meditator, but he also experiences or she also experiences the same thing. But when you are going to explain, they will say, I am experiencing a female kind of pain, you are a male, or I am young, or I am old, or I am so and so, but all these are just conventions. But the mere set of pains are equal. Once you have seen the whole range within you, definitely you can understand how the other person, whether he is contemplative or not. So that is how you compare and see the whole universe, the whole humanity through the sensation of, or through the mentality of feeling. So we can say we are in the deep bedrock of the ocean of feeling. All the time we are in the feeling, as far as we are not in the deep sleep. So we are specializing. And when it is happening, Samudhe Dhammana Pasiva. Vedana also be a Whenever the Vedana arises, pressure, pain or indifference, you know, you are ready 
you are prepared to see the beginning. Why the manupa siva vedana sabhi When the weight is going, you are not disheartened or you are not be elated. You know this is the nature of pain, the nature of the feeling. And then samudhe vai dhammanu pasiva vedanasu virgi. So the beginning, that is the end. Arising and passing away. When arising and passing away happens, the different taste between the pain and pleasure disappears. Only leaving the indifference. That is how ati vedanasi va sati pachu patita hodi. You will merely see is a, an ocean of pain. You will mindfully be aware the whole day is a kind of feeling. Atti Vedana Ativa Sati Pachupatita Hoti. The mindfulness will be alert and on the spot, be on the ball, on the feelings. Yahudeva Jana Mattaya Patisati Mattaya. This much of experience is just to awaken the wisdom and just to awaken or just to step past your mindfulness. Anisitocha Virati Nachakinji Logi Upadi. Such a person will never grasp. They were called, this is my feeling, or this is my pleasurable, this is my painful, that is the kind of uh, personal view. But the pain as pain have universality. So therefore, (coughs) anisita also virati. Anisita means you are not going to recognize by this flux of pains. I am a pleasurable person, I am a painful person, this story is a tragedy, this story is a comedy, all these are just passing show. Instead you will be anisitoja virati. You are getting a distance from the pain. Doctors are asked to get a clinical distance from the patient. Otherwise he, she or she will not be a doctor. You can't recognize the pain, the pain of the patient. Then you can't um, master your knowledge. Exactly. You are very pain, you must try to get a distance. The main uh, tool for the um, feeling is the distance, looking at it as if from the other person's pain. Then Anishitocha Virati Nachakinchi Loke Upadit is not going to claim this pain is the one that I have maximized, or pleasure is the one that I have to maximize, that is to say, Kama Sukhalikana Yoga and Atakilmatana Yoga self-indulgence or self-modification, these both has to give up. Otherwise you will not come back to the middle part. But when you are to observe, the whole world is after pleasure. So how can this kind of profoundity Dhamma can happen? So that is why the yogi has to really think, really contemplate, and wait till the pain and the pleasure comes, just to see them as feelings. And that is how Evanchapo Bhikkave Bhikkhu Vedanasu Vedananu Pasi Vedanasu That is the, the whole idea of the Buddha. Vedana is a, a real tool for someone to get a conception about the whole sansara. So the way you react indicate who you are. Where you go, there you are. I think enough for the day. And we have taken more than one hour and ten minutes. So I hope everyone may experience the indifference feeling in the meditation of sitting meditation of meditation on the in breath and out breath, as well as in the walking meditation, as well as in the day to day affair, that does not indicate the callousness. That does not indicate is you are withdrawn from the life. This is the living. Otherwise you are in a dream. To be awakened, you have to be awake, you have to be present on the, all the kind of feelings. That is the way you train yourself to face the, all the vegetables of the life. That is the kind of a training even after the enlightenment. It is so much we are being shaken by this gain and the fame, pain and the pleasure. So, so much so we are called the Commoners. You are called Putuja. Whenever you come back to the feelings as feeling, you are opening the door to the noble life, the cultured life, elevated life. So therefore, I hope no one must, no one must, must, must inflict feelings upon you. Everyone have 
uh, their own fair share. So try to be mindful and to be aware of the beginning, the middle and the end of the pain. Definitely you will understand what is the Dhamma and what is the Buddha. Whenever you see the Buddha, you will understand who you are and that is how the seeing the Buddha through the Dhamma happens. May you all be blessed with the triple gem and may, be, may all you be happy, healthy and wealthy. Thank you very much. You can summarize the term Atitanu Dhavana and Chitta Vikopana Padita. That is the universal truth even to the Buddha. He says, whenever you recollect the past, it is a disheartening. That is a universal truth. It is the cross section or rule of thumb. Atitanu Dhavana and Chitta Vikopana Padita. Vikopa means you really feel sorry. So therefore, he who lived in the past, you can tell by the face. She are so depressed. Can't help. Because that they think their duty to be live in the past. And they always say that this is the thing happened, therefore how can I entertain the 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 beautiful breeze? How can I see the greenness of the the yard? How can I see the beauty of the flower? Because I am not meant. Because I am I have done this and that. All the kinds of, but he do not know. He whoever, whenever, who, whoever look, recollect the past is definitely disappointment. Even the Buddha is the same. So you have to understand it so now you are experiencing kind of a truth. As far as the mind is associated with the past, it's a disappointment. As far as the mind is associated with the future, it is an excitement. So these two, so nothing wrong with this, everything is there, but some people entertain the past throughout and then they are so depressed and they feel it is their duty. They are meant to be depressed. So what to do? One day they have to understand their mind is so biased, it is in a such a rut, it is in such an habitual way, always uh, ruminating the cud eating what you have already taken. That is what the cows are doing in the night. Daytime they are eating and in the night ruminating and chewing the cud. But they think they are thinkers. I feel sorry for them. What thinking? The presence is so nice, it is so crispy, it is so electric, it is so fresh, but they are cutting themselves to come to the present. They say it is something not nice. This thing is to be in the past and depressed. These are the way the karma is working. 
So we can't pull them into put into the perfect person. So Buddha says in the Baddha Karatha Sutta, three suttas consecutively he says, forget about the past. Because it has already gone. Don't think about the future. Because it has not come. Be in the present. But some say this is so radical. They say you are um, existentialist. You have forgotten about our great, great, great cultural back. The golden age of the Sri Lankan history, Buddhism, Sri Lankan Buddhist. So think about that and if you are going to come present, it is not nice. And do that. If you wish to go to the Chinese hotel, you can go and eat Chinese hotel, but there are only Chinese food available. That you can't go to the Chinese hall and ask the Japanese foods. In the, in the, when you go to the jungle, many, many stalls are there. Where you go, there you are. So therefore, these are macro level, you can see the different people. But all the people are representing in our heart also. We have sometimes, we are always regret about the past. I can't help. Sometimes it is dragon and going beyond and going to the future and then future by last time I did the mistake. This time I will never do and it will be and I will do like that. Everything forgotten and going jump into the future and again churning in the excitement. So this is the way the human mind, that is why the Buddha is half smile. Always looking at the people with a half smile because he can see how the people are going, spending the time, past time either past or the future. So that is why he says, just sitting, just beyond the in-breath and out-breath, how wise, how pure, how crispy. Forget about the Maggapalanyana, forget about the Dhyana, just be in the breath. And it is only possible for the human being, just mindfulness, next to the Nibbana. But we, if we know, no, no, we are already experienced mindfulness, now we have to have first jhana, or second jhana, or third jhana, or I must be become a sotapanna. So again, future planning and excitement, and again, nekkamma sita homan do manasi. So it is not the paradattu, parasita vijana na jhana. When you read Venable Jhana Rama's book, he says there are six traps for the meditation, either recollecting the past or going to the future. Or you are very desired to the object, or you are fighting with, or either sleepy or excited. These are the only six traps. Once you have sorted them out, are back to the field. But if you say these are misfortune, or these are enemies, and if you are going to react with them, throughout you will be fighting. You have to understand this is a part and parcel of the human life, and we are lucky we know. We have diagnosed who we are. We have diagnosed, we are the people, we are the person. I am a person that I am always in the past, so therefore I am always depressed or disappointed or um, not happy. But sometimes we are living in the future, so young people are living in the future, old people are living in the past. Am I correct? Um, not exactly. Okay. 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 Okay
So therefore, try to entertain the life. You see, I have never done this kind of a killing of animals. I have never done any kind of stealing. I have never gone for sexual misconduct and not lying. And all the guys, therefore, you see, I am 120 years old. The young person has asked. So then the, what is the use of 120 years? <laughs> it's flat. No kick. <laughs> so you have to do anything. If you wish, you can burn the candle both the wicks, on both the ends. You feel like two weeks, and what happened to the candle? So it is, you have enough energy, you have enough the life, and you have to. That Buddha says that if you are straight on the candle and going for one week, the whole the wax will be turned into the light. If you are going to burn the big the candle from the both the ends, you can try and see. Go go life, go go show. I don't, anyway, this, uh, yes? Sorry, I'm not like my confession, but just to go back to that question, you talk about not living in the past, but not living in the future. On a practical level, you talk about the household of life and young people having to plan for family and work out their mortgage and work out where they're going in career life, so they're, they're living in the future, but it's, it's necessary to actually to go through that planning. Yeah, that if you are developing the argument telling that the future planning is a must, definitely you are encountering or you are getting committed into the planning and the whatever the consequences coming, you have to, you are answerable because your volition is there, your intention is there in the planning. But if you look at and see wherever you have any entertainer success, most of them are accidents. The highest success in our life happening in an accident. That does not indicate no planning is completely going ad hoc. So therefore, this planned life is one alternative. And the early of our history, the, the ancient people, they were up to the any moment and they are living in then here and then. And it's basically the, the Baden Powell uh, introduced this boy scout and the girl guides. He says, try to be impromptu learn improvisation and then you are living then and there that is what the life of camping and going for a picnic so this is also you can't forget they are the, well, the circumstantial facing the situation is the um, the beauty of the human life so planned life is one alternative it is called central plan economy but where the central plan economy is going? They are aiming at the atomic bomb and the neutron bomb, all the kind of thing. So the planning is crafty mind and you do not know. Plan is aimed at what? What is you are going to maximize? For the moment you will see the economic goal, you will, the moment you will see the political gain, or you may see the stability of the society. But that is the, just the close objective. But when you are what is the criteria? What is the object of planning? Then you will see, oh, who am I? Where I am planning? So these things has to uh, slowly, slowly, layer by layer, you will understand and as far as you are planning, you are definitely not in this moment. You are in the future. Instead, Buddha says, okay, leave 23 hours for planning. Just leave one hour in the present and see the difference. And then you will see whether this household life, household kind of pressure, or this renunciated kind of pressure, you can put. So therefore, if you still believe and if you are to support the planned life, don't change the day-to-day -day activities. But instead, try to get 15 to 30 minutes or something like that, try to live unplanned life. Of course, that is coming out of plan. To live 20 hours, 30 minutes is kind of a plan. But there you try to give out, try to give up, and just to be with the present moment. And then you can compare, and it's verifiable. So therefore, what you come out is, your argument is one alternative. You can't deny, you can completely cut off. 
But Buddha is giving an alternative. Instead of planned life, try to be here and now. And then the creativity comes. The planned life, never the creativity comes. Because you are reacting, you are conditioning. Whenever you relax, the creativity comes. Then, then and there, the happiness. That is, sometimes it's called inhuman. That, that happiness is amanusirati hoti, unalienable. And that unalloyed kind of pressure comes in the, in the coincidence, and never in the planning. I am just giving an alternative to, to, to your formula. Try both and try to see, try to verify yourself. I mean, that 99% true because many people think rationally uh, it must be planned and calculated. Therefore, let that society, let your timetable run. Meanwhile, just an alternative, get 15 to 30 minutes, be in the present moment. The day you cut through and come to the, the indifference pay, indifference feeling, you feel how nice to be there. The totality of just being, the totality of the feeling, and then you feel like the, the completeness, the contentment, not through the eye, not through the ear, not through the nose, not through the tongue, not through the body, but through the solitude. And there you find that every pressure, every tension is releasing, and you feel fresh. You can look the life like a young boy in front of the toy life. So that is how the Buddha is not challenging the existing uh, the system of the life, but he says, <coughs> instead, just try to introduce a little bit and try to compare yourself. Of course, not in the first try, two, three, try, two, three uh, sessions time, you can understand. That is why you people are here, because otherwise you have so much of things to plan and to do. But here you find that kind of a pressure comes which you can't gain through the materialistic. So, then, so ultimately some people find maximization of this kind of a pleasure. But even the majority is the other way. So therefore this is swimming against the current. It's of course against the current, or in the sense against the grain. So only the brave people, only the wise people will find a verifiable or substantial gain in it. But even then that the tradition, the consistency is there. There is a small fraction of uh, our population always put the immaterial pressure higher than the materialistic pressure. There is no competition as such because they are not contradictory. Both complementary, so that is why nowadays the question is how to incorporate meditation into the day to day life. So then some find very quick and very pragmatic answers, many are not yet. Yeah, that is the maximum or theoretical maximum one has to aim for it. One has to set an as objective. But out of that, Buddha, with the so much of experience, he says, all the sense doors have no equal accessibility because some senses are very tricky, very fast and very swift. Unless otherwise you have a well-trained mindfulness and the concentration, you can't tackle them. So he says the eye is the most tricky. So therefore the seeing and being aware at the seeing, looking or seeing is very difficult because it is happening in the very high tension. And then next the ear, next the tongue, nose, next the tongue. And the easiest is the body. So therefore he says, start where the, the easy point, where the gross things are there. Once the body, out of the body also, the materialistic part and where the earth element, the air element, all the kind of thing. Out of all the four elements, he says, air element is the most prominent. So therefore he says, go for the embrace and outbreath. 
or go for the rising and falling of the mind. Both of them are based upon the, the vayo or tabadatu. So this he gives the ways and means, I mean, tracing the least frictional path. So of course all the others are possible. But he says, start where the gross things are there. Start where the, the, the consequence is there. And then you are bound to get me less and less dangers, less and less trap holes. So that is why the the anapana, it is not a coincidence, it's a calculated thing. He says the anapana is based upon AI element and that brings you back to the materiality and it leads to the earth element, to your water element, heat element and then these are mastered, you will be slowly going taken to the mentality part and mentality also the most gross thing is the feeling and then you have to go to the other mental aspects and then the other dharma, likewise it is a a known to unknown part. So therefore, theoretically maximum or theoretically you can say, be aware whenever the sense object come and impinges. And if it is so, master. Just be aware when the in breath comes. Just be aware when the out breath comes. So it's a sizable, handleable, perceivable end. That is, that is why she is saying what is the equilibrium. So that is why she also asking if you are be aware of the seeing, the hearing, the smelling, the touching or the tasting, touching and the discomfort, the comfort and the boredom, all the kind of things, that is the middle way. That is the way you are not completely giving up planning and you are not going to refuse because it is not planned. You are ready. But that is a very skillful job, that is very challenging job. So therefore you have to still at the beginning you have to plan it. Plan thirty minutes and go for the corporeality, go for the AI element and try to develop what does it mean by the mindfulness and what does it mean by the one pointedness. It's very subtle and very tender. But you are maximizing. When you are maximizing definitely the pain comes. Definitely the thought comes. Definitely the other liking and disliking comes. Slowly, slowly you are developing the threshold value, the tolerance. And likewise it is happening, therefore two people can't trace the same path. Because your own likings and dislikings are different. Your own combination is different. But the Buddha is assimilated a universal path. He says, start where the gross things. And then don't disturb your normal day-to-day -day life and try to lead the way. And ultimately those who are skillful and those who are meritorious find this is exciting, I mean this is electric and it is giving a complete the see-through, the depth in the human society. And ultimately that if you are unskillful, you feel like antagonizing the society. If it is why I am saying you don't have the common sense. But at the beginning the, the worst thing is whenever the traditional people trying to observe uh, the morality, they feel all the other people immoral. They feel all the other people must be corrected first before he he will absorb the precepts. So then an unwanted kind of a friction arises. So that is why one of my friends told, whenever his mother is going to the temple and do metta bhavana, the fighting at home. <laughs> Because she can't tolerate anything. Anything can she can tolerate, but not for the family members. It's a, it's a, it's a disease, I mean, it's a common sense. So that is why you have to associate a lot of people, those who are doing meditation, and be aware of the common sense. This kind of thing happens. So they are planning or not planning, you can get the, these two extremes. You have to find the middle path where be aware. Or in English we call be on the board. Whatever the thing, it's a message. Don't, don't shut the door. Be aware of it. Ultimately, you will be really living in the present moment and you will find the future planning is a habit, can't help. And you are not going to appreciate it. You see, it is happening. 
and the, the depression and the weak and sad about the future, past, also something. So, but these two indicate you are in the middle. So the way is open. This is not the authority of anyone. It's you have to understand the technique and keep on doing. So therefore, any time is tea time in Sri Lanka. Likewise, any time is for mindfulness in, you know, it is Australia or in you know, Sri Lanka with the male or female. Mindfulness has no sex. It has no any time aspect. So universal. So otherwise, how can you explain the in-breath versus out-breath without the feelings? The teacher will ask, what is the difference between the in-breath and out-breath? How you are going to express? No, oh, that is the, the in-breath and out-breath manifests in terms of feeling, otherwise how do you know? How do you know this is not in-breath, out-breath? This is not out-breath, this is in-breath. Because you feel it, you experience it. You can't, otherwise you can't communicate it. That is why the whole Hindu knowledge is known as Veda. But everything what is felt and there what is the experience of the whole, the, our um, uh, ancestors. So that we, our, everything is Veda. Veda means what is Veda now? Whatever you feel, come to your sphere. Whatever you not feel, no, out of your question. So therefore, in return, not a difference is asking a wrong question. It is just to, to align you, just to keep close with the obje- observation, ask what is the difference. Difference you have to explain in terms of feeling. Or other, otherwise, how but? Yeah. The final point, you mean? Mm-hmm. Not the final. Mm-hmm. This is a kind of a tool. So what do you mean by the long and short? You feel longer rub and you feel shorter rub. That is the long and short. That is feeling. Whatever you are going to say, I mean, you have to use the language. There are letters and the grammar and everything we used. That is just to communicate. Exactly, you are communicating through the feeling. Otherwise, there is no the, the communication. That is why the trees and the rocks are different from us, because they can't feel. So, Whenever pleasure and pain comes, on the way, after a while, you pain the pain, but you pay pain, and you feel that today my meditation is good. So like that, it, it comes according to its own way. So you must not discriminate them. Pain is good and pleasure is bad. Like whenever they come, you try to be ready to accept them. At the beginning, of course, you see the materiality. At the, the, naturally, sorry, after a while, different pains and comes. And what whenever comes, if the mindfulness is there, do not sacrifice the mindfulness, but be aware of what is happening. Something like the, you know, when you think of that regretting problem, if you contemplate not this year, contemplate and if you go to that second inside knowledge of the A to Pala, can you sort of classify it? Like you can, you can change the pattern of that or? No, that uh, I, I feel the base of your question, but I am telling you is, but what you have to be aware of is the question or the summarization for his statement is simply Atitanu Dahanan Chitta Vikopanu Padita. Whenever you go back, it's a regret or disappointment. So there are three points are there. Whenever you go to the back, you have lost your primary object. That's the first and foremost. The second thing is whenever you go to the back, you go to the the past, it is called as thinking. So primary of it has been replaced by thinking. And your mental mood is the depression. So there are three aspects are there for you to get corrected. The cause and effects, 
must be geared to the correction, not to the go back to the past thoughts and analyze it and see what is the cause for thinking. That is completely appreciating the past, completely appreciating the regret. Instead you are saying this regression of going back is because I have sacrificed my first object, my primary object. The thing is to come back and reinstall the primary object, if possible. Otherwise be aware, it's a regret, it's a thought. Don't try to analyze the thought whether it's past and it is due to this, I have do this and that. It's a kind of giving food for the past thoughts and the, the thinking will be more uh, appreciated. So therefore, you are not going to see the uh, cause and effect of that thinking. You must know cause is your lack of mindfulness. You are absent-minded, that is the cause. So uh, quickly reinstall the mindfulness, then you will back into the to the my primary object. But then anyway, I am happy that uh, many have followed my talk. I thought this is uh, so deep that I thought I have lost. Yes? I have a quick question, just on, on, on a small point on that. I, I just wonder, can you ever reflect back and it not be regret? Can you ever reflect back and it not be regret? You've done something good that you feel good about it brings you joy. Is it still sometimes so that means anyhow you have lost the present moment. Yeah, I, I understand, and that's a good point, but just like a small one. Can, so, can it be good? And the second thing, you are in the ego trip. Oh. Second thing. <laughs> and this definitely this happened in the ignorance. Yes. So you are fostering the ignorance. So definitely whatever the past, good or bad, some total is negative. Yes. I mean destructive. So only the construction, only the peace, only the equilibrium, only the, the, the progress in the present. Whatever the argument you are going to say and going to fill it to the future or the past, it is not reality. I mean, present and the future is a concept. The reality is in the present, so you have to make your mind. The reality is the life. Other things are just projections. So if you are going to take the projections as a reality, definitely your projections will lead to something cavity. So therefore, live in the present, be in the present, and then you will see the, the, your youth, your, the very living energy, the vitality, and the living Dhamma is always with you, and you feel enormous protection. In no one's protection, whatever the thing happened, you are in the present. So that is the art, I mean, that is the thing you have to train. I, I don't know with how much the training will give the results, and this is how you must straighten your objectives. Being in the present is the highest of our humanness. And then you are fully with the, the circumstance. Otherwise you are in a dream. So Buddha says that he is being recognized as the awakened one. Awakened to what? Awakened to the present moment. Buddha. See, the term comes from the Prabuddha. Prabuddha means awakened. He says all the others are in sleep. They are also tumbling here and there and all the kind of it is in dream. They are not awakened. So he want he wanted the others also to be awakening. So he says only the key, only the doorway is in the present. They both give the same quality, I would say. Mitta, the best definition I have read in the, from the Western terminology, try to be glad under the, whatever the circumstances. That is Mitta. Try to find a reason to be glad whatever may be the circumstances. That is Mitta. That is, see only the love spots. Don't see the dark side. And that is exactly the mindfulness to explain it, be in the present moment. Metta also try to see the whole phenomena and get the brighter side. Forget about the bad, because it is not Metta. 
So it is also asking you to face the situation as it can, as and when it happens. The mindfulness is, do not try to see the bright and black, be total. Be aware of the totality, which is more brave, which is more challenging. So therefore, metta is the concentration type of serenity kind of a tactic. The mindfulness is wisdom kind of, or insight kind of tactic. So you must have both the weapons in your bag to face the line. Sometimes you use the metta tool, <coughs> or serenity tool, and then you bomb it off. But whenever possible, accept the totality. Accepting totality is more brave and more involved. So therefore, the, the certainty uh, is uh, comparably lower in grade than the wisdom or inside meditation. Good that question. I am happy because this thing I have not dealt uh, because that metta has not been much given value. But it has a huge uh, the utility value for the yogi's life. Whenever possible, you must not, you must have metta balm. Whenever irritation happens, just apply. Now 10.15, eh? <laughs> so when the, that... Yeah, that is... So, so that uh, metta is given as guardian meditation. There are four guardian meditation, recollection of the virtues of the Buddha, the loving kindness of the metta, and the recollection on the death and the repulsivity of the body. So these are like uh, the rails. Whenever you're going to incline and fall, you just hang them on the rail and you straighten back again. So these four have utility values. The Buddha knows that is good when you feel exhausted. And recollecting of the Buddha, you say, he has no teacher, he has no particular supporters, he has no dwelling places. Even then he knew that I have to do, I will do. Unseasoned manner. He went there and got the thing. So when you, you feel comparing yourself with the, I am a disciple of the Buddha. How can I complain for the others? I have to be find my way. So your mind will become again be with the tonic and with the, the vigor. So go that the metta, the Buddha will call Sampahansana. And the metta is for the hatred. Whenever the hatred comes and then irritation and the friction, the wear and tear, you find it very, very horrible in the life. But the, the gain you got is coming back to the zero level and everything is very horrible. So then you have to use metta, the loving kindness. It is just the negative of the lack of hatred. And in the Maranano Sadi, those people who are always postponing, telling I am too young and I have children and this and that, then you have to say that death has no discrimination. When it comes, it comes. Whether you are a mother or father, you are pregnant or you are already parturated, no problem. It will take. When the tsunami comes, all the virtuous people and not virtuous, everything is wiped off. And there is a village, even the village headman is also taken out, therefore no complaints. <laughs> And that is the death. And then the repulsivity comes if you are entertaining the, the erratic feelings and the sense pleasure and entertaining the opposite sex and kind of thing. Uh, answer is this repulsivity. So you must know they are prescription drugs, not the over the counter. <laughs> so you must have a prescription, then the doctor go and he says, yes, you have irritation all the time in the meditation, so go for the metta. But thing is, the display is so cheap and over the counter, everyone bags carry display. That means they are expecting headaches. <laughs> but metta is not so. But unlucky enough, before this recent upheaval of the inside, all the serious meditators were just contented with four guardian meditation. They never step into this serious kind of meditation. So traditional Buddhists only know these. So they think, without them, how can I go to the serious meditation life? 
So they are ever doing the pre- preparation, they will do the start the job. So instead we have to say start the job. While doing you will understand what kind of a person you are. You may be the hated kind. You may be kind of a the desire and the kind of the sense pleasure. So accordingly the, def- the doctor will write a prescription. So therefore when you are doing anapana meditation, the irritation happens someone is opening the door and to stepping and coughing and every time if you are get irritation and very difficult to continue with the anapana, then you have to clearly indicate to the teacher, he will say yes, you have to give up the anapana and try to develop loving kindness to the other and then take into the anapana line. So therefore it is it must be a uh, the simple way is presenting is the prescription drug, not the over the counter type. Again, again, reminding 10.20. Yes, tomorrow at 8.30? No. That today all the technical talks and the Dhamma talk finished. Tomorrow I am also have free, so 8.30 to 10 we can go for discussion basically in single medium. And no more programs, they don't work. Yes. Feel very sorry. Very sorry.